Happy Sabbath. We're so happy to have you with us today. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Welcome to Oceanside SDA Church. From the Pipersburg family. <laughs> I'd like to welcome you to another church service. Here we are online again. And uh, I pray that you're doing good, staying safe and healthy. Uh, I would, would really like to say thank you to the membership of this church because actually we're doing quite well financially. You folks are giving and uh, we're keeping our nose above water as far as finances go, both in tithe and in local giving. And of course we have a lot of expenses in our local budget, we are supporting the school. We are doing all kinds of things that cost money. And um, the support so far, despite COVID-19, has been solid. And I thank you for that. It's good. Now, there are some things afoot and some possibilities that we may be able to come back uh, and start meeting together as a church. And the conference office up in Riverside is working with us, and uh, they are insisting that we carefully follow the policies for reopening that the County of San Diego is giving us. And uh, those, uh, those policies and those restrictions are really quite stringent at this point. Uh, they are saying that if we get back together, we can only have one quarter of our normal uh, church attendance in, in the sanctuary for church. And everybody must uh, wear a mask and six, uh, sit six feet apart. And uh, there can be no singing, uh, no, uh, no kids gathering up in the front for kids' story, nothing like that. We need to do screening out at the door for everybody that comes in. And uh, there's quite a few hoops to jump through so but we're working on it and we're thinking about it some folks and maybe i'm part of this group think that uh man if we get together everybody's wearing a mask sitting far apart we can't sing uh, maybe we should wait a few more weeks that might be just a little bit of a down experience to come back, longing to come back, and then it's kind of uh, a halfway church service. By the way, uh, uh, preaching would have to be done um, either with a mask or with some kind of a shield in front of her, you know, and, and there's a lot of, a lot of restrictions. So anyway, church leadership's talking about it, thinking about it, and uh, give us your input. Uh, what do you think? Should we wait a little bit longer? Should we try to get back uh, even despite the restrictions? Uh, let us know what you think about that. May God bless. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. One more time. Yes, Jesus loves. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so.
Well, with 
Now is the time for prayer. We have uh, a lot to be thankful for, and also we have a lot of people that we need to be praying for. Um, we also want to continue to pray, pray for the Taupau family. They, um, we just found out recently that Nehru uh, lost his sister as well um, last week, and so they're going through they're going through this whole thing. Um, so we're gonna definitely pray for for comfort, for peace. For their family, we want to also continue to uphold the the healthcare professionals, the frontline workers right now, as they are going through um, the pandemic and trying to do their best to make sure that we are all uh, taken care of. So yeah, let's uh, let's uh, close our eyes and bow our heads for for time of prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for this time that you have given us to come to you and to seek you in prayer. Um, thank you for the, the way that you've blessed us, Lord, in the last couple of days and weeks, especially during this time that's so disorienting, Lord. We wanna pray for um, the Taupa'u family as they're going through so many losses, Lord, and uh, uh, through it all, they've, they've taken the attitude of, of of praise, really, and, and, and being confident in you, Jesus. So I pray that you'd continue to be with them and um, let your surrounding, let your comfort and your peace surround their family, Lord. We want to pray for all the healthcare workers and the healthcare professionals, Jesus. Please keep them all under your care and keeping. And uh, you know the people and the families, Lord, in our community. You know us by name. You know us by our past and our stories. So I pray that you would sensitize our hearts and sensitize our minds to the frequency of your voice, Lord, at all times. That even during this dark time, Lord, help us to see you and see you moving in our families and our workplaces. Thank you so much for all your blessings. Thank you for Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. everyone. Today I want to tell you the story of Lonnie Johnson. You'll recognize some of the things he's made. He grew up in Alabama and was born about 70 years ago, lived with his five brothers and sisters in a small house. He loved to tinker and make things. One time he was making rockets, made rocket fuel on the stove, only it caught fire. Mom said, Lonnie, you have to go outside. I'll give you a hot plate, but you have to take your experiments outside. And so he did. When he was in high school, he built a robot that really worked. He used a jukebox. He used a cassette player. You'll have to ask mom and dad or grandma and grandpa what those things are. And he put it together, but he couldn't figure out how to talk to it, how to make it move. So finally, he think, thought about his sister's walkie talkies. Took those and used them and it worked. He and his team entered the project into the state science fair and they won first place. He went on to cut a, go to college, took a test because he wanted to be an engineer and so they were placing him and the test said, you do not have the skills to be an engineer. Lonnie disagreed, he knew he did. So he kept on, he graduated, started working as as a scientist for NASA in the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He did all kinds of cool things like working on different orbiters and getting communication systems for them. One time he decided to work on refrigerant for your refrigerators. It was at the time a Freon, which was not a chemical you want around. So he thought, how can I change this? He got water and pressure, started working together and thought this might work. So he created the nozzle and took it into the bathroom and hooked it up to the sink and turned it on. Whoa, that water came out so fast and strong. It blew the shower curtains up, squirted clear across the room and he thought, hey, this would make a fun toy. So he started tinkering some more. He got a water, a soda bottle, 
PVC pipes and plexiglass and tinkered and put it together. He had to work hard to get the controls soft enough and easy enough for a child to use because he wanted it to be a child's toy. And then after he perfected it, he started taking it to toy companies. Everyone said, nope, we don't want it. Nope, no one will want that. Until finally a company said yes. The Laramie company said yes, we will design and make it. And they called it the Super Soaker. Perhaps you're acquainted with one. Maybe you even have one. It's a really fun water squirter. The first, after, in 1992, it was the number one toy sold, bringing in $200 million. Pretty good success story. It's not all he's made. He also went on to make the Nerf, Nerf blaster gun. Have you seen the one that shoots out darts, Nerf darts? He invented that too. When he... He had lots of money from all these inventions, but you know what he did with it? He built a bigger lab so he could make more things because he loves inventing things. He says that it's important to persevere, to keep on. Even when people tell you, you can't do that, keep on doing it. Even when things look hard, keep on doing it. You know, the Bible says something about perseverance. It says, blessed is he who remains steadfast under trial, who persevere who keep on going. I hope you'll remember that. When things get rough and it's hard to get your schoolwork done, it's hard to do everything you need to get done, remember that about Perseverance and Lonnie and how he persevered. And now maybe you'll get a chance on a hot summer day to play with a super soaker and you can say a thank you to Lonnie for inventing such a fun toy. All right, have a great week, guys. Uh, good morning. Happy Sabbath. Good to be back together once again. Hope you're doing well and staying healthy. This morning I'd like to talk to the kids from our church that are graduating. We have quite a few kids that are graduating either from eighth grade or high school or college or kindergarten or, or wherever. 
And I'd like to talk to them and to their parents, grandparents, a little bit about school, education, learning. These things can be hard things. It can be hard to really, really learn something, especially if it's something that's new. It takes some determination. It takes some stick to But in the end, it can be a grand adventure and be so worth it. And the education, you graduates, that you have been given is actually a gift. It's a gift from your parents. They have sacrificed to get you where you are. A gift from your teachers. And a gift from the people in this church who have sacrificed so much to make your education happen. It's a good thing. You know, it's interesting. When I was a kid growing up, my family was a pretty musical family. And we did a certain kind of music. We did campfire songs at summer camps. And uh, we all played instruments. Everybody in the family played instruments. And we sang songs like Kumbaya or When the Saints Go Marching In or uh, uh, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And there was something in those songs, especially at campfire in the summertime, towards the end when all the kids in the whole camp would be softly singing some song together, like Kumbaya, something like that. And ah, I could feel the Spirit of God coming to me through that song. There was a call there. I learned to find God in songs like that. Time went on and I was growing up and finally I, I got to college. And by now my father had passed away. But I'm telling you, my mother really sacrificed to get me through college, financially and everything else. Uh, she encouraged me so much. She uh, worked so hard to keep me in college. And it was a funny thing, but when I got to La Sierra College, there was kind of a group of people who um, everybody called them Jesus people <laughs> in those days. And they, uh, they typically walked around with a guitar over their back and uh, maybe they were barefoot and they were like uh, Christian singing troubadours who uh, would sing Christian songs and they would sing things like Kumbaya. And, so, and I, I was kind of identified with that group of people who did that kind of stuff. But there was also a group of students at the school who were pianists. They were violinists. They were quite different. They wore shoes, they wore suits, they did things like that. And they played a very, very different kind of music. And I didn't know much about them or really know them. But once in a while, for a Friday evening Vespers. They would put up posters around the school. They would say, an evening with Bach adagios. And then up in Meyer Chapel, the school body would get together. And one of these kids from the music department, maybe a pianist, would come and sit down and simply play some of these beautiful, very, very soft, smooth songs and every note was so precise. Every note seemed to fall right exactly where it belonged. And I would listen to that and I would love it and I could hear God's voice speaking to me through that kind of music. And I wanted more of it. I wanted to learn more about it. So I started asking around, you know, oh, uh, you know, how can I, what, what can I do? It wasn't like I was a, a pianist or a violinist or anything else like that. But somebody told me, they said, well, you should go uh, to the music department and take a class that's called music theory. So for the fall quarter next fall, I registered for music theory and didn't know much about it. People told me, uh, it's pretty hard. Uh, hope you know what you're doing. 
And so the first evening, uh, the class met at nighttime, but the first evening I walked down the hallway and I could hear a piano playing, that very soft, beautiful Bach adagio style of music. And I walked into the room where the class was meeting and here was Dr. Beach, Perry Beach. Uh, I'd known him for a long time, growing up with his kids, but here he was. He was sitting at the piano and he was playing. He was a genius piano player. And he just sat there and was softly playing this wonderful, beautiful, beautiful piano music. And as he was playing, he was talking to the kids that were coming into the room, greeting them, saying, hi, good to see you, talk to me. Everybody sat down and then he kept right on playing and he started introducing the course as he's playing and he's telling everybody exactly, you know, what's required in the course and how to get a good grade and all of this kind of stuff and how uh, student participation is part of your grade and how he would be asking students questions and, uh, and their accuracy in answering stuff that went into your grade. And as he was playing that first night, all of a sudden he stopped on a chord and he backed up and he, and, and he played into that chord again and stopped again. And then he looked at one of the students and he called him by name and he says, what inversion is that chord? And you know what? I didn't even know what the word inversion meant, but this student right up in front goes, uh, uh, that's second inversion. And so Dr. Beach goes, and why would Bach be using a second inversion in this spot? Well, the student didn't know why Bach would be doing that, but uh, Dr. Beach started playing again and he started to explain how that changed the feel of things and how that kind of set things up for what's coming on down the road in the song. And throughout that whole class period, he talked to us about all kinds of different things in music, introducing us to the subject. And he talked about inversions. He talked about cadences and, sh and he would stop and show us a different cadence that Bach might be using at some point or another. He talked about uh, the well-tempered scale. He talked about all this. I had no idea. This whole thing was a foreign world to me. It was a foreign language. I didn't know what any of this stuff was. And I sat there, uh, but I was loving the way he was playing and the way that music spoke to me and it seemed to bring me close to God. And Dr. Beach was an interesting character. He could be so sarcastic with people. He had kind of this sharp edge about him, but he could get by with it because <laughs> he was so good hearted. He cared about, he cared about students so much and it was evident and he would do anything. And at the same time, he could be sarcastic. He could give people a hard time in class. He would give me a hard time. Sometimes he would uh, ask me some question. I would have no idea what he was talking about. I was just lost in there. And he would chuckle and kind of laugh and make a little bit of fun of me. And uh, but once in a while when he'd call on me and I'd get it right, you know, all the students, that was kind of like their little mascot. They realized I didn't know what I was doing. And, but they, I think they, they liked it because I was trying so hard. And, <laughs> and they would kind of chuckle and laugh. And if I got things right, they would kind of clap a little bit. But I can remember one day um, Dr. Beach was talking about the Jesus people. And he mentioned this one guy, uh, didn't use, uh, use a name, but he said this. So uh, one uh, guy would get up with his guitar sometimes in chapel and he'd always have a little uh, speech ready to go before he sang and he would, Dr. Beach is mimicking this guy and he's gone. Hey, he's, he gets up in front of the microphone and he says, well, God just uh, woke me up in, uh, in the middle of the night and it just, I, I just sat up and God just gave me this song and, and I just felt like I just needed to get right up and, and write down this song that God just gave to me. And so I'm just gonna sing this song. And he was, he was talking about how this, uh, how this kid uh, 
who would get up and sing these songs that God just gave to him. And then he kind of raised his eyebrows and said, do you really think God gave him that song? And everybody kind of chuckled. He could get by with giving people a hard time because he really cared about all the students in that college. He would give a hard time to the theory of evolution. He would say, do you really think that the human race is getting better and stronger? He would go, do you really think that composers nowadays can write a song like J.S. Bach could write a song? And everybody knew that uh, Dr. Beach was a well-known, internationally known, famous composer. But he was asking us, do you really think that anybody nowadays can write a song like Bach did? He lived two, he was writing 200 years ago. Are we getting better? The obvious answer was no, probably not. Listen to this. We were learning the delicate, complicated beauty of what Bach wrote, you know, and uh, he would say, Bach. And I'm not pronouncing it right, but I'd, I'd do the best I can. Bach was so close to God, so in tune with the Holy Spirit, that his writing was far beyond anything we can do today. He said when Bach would struggle with the song and finally get it to where he was halfway satisfied and the thing was finished, at the very bottom of the score, he would write Soli Dea Gloria. Solely, only to the glory of God. It's what his whole life was about. He's saying he was far beyond where we are these days. You don't believe in evolution. Dream on. So, that first quarter was spinning off, and I was so loving what I heard. He would spend most of the class period playing on the piano, playing Bach. And he was talking at the same time, and he would just stop in a song and ask people, why is Bach doing this? Why is Bach doing that? Why on earth, you know, do you have this inversion? Why this cadence in this certain situation? All of this stuff. Uh, and I was, you know, I was three quarters lost, but I was listening, and I was loving the music. And uh, then, he started in with dictation. That's something you do, I guess, in music theory, at least in uh, uh, J.S. Beach's uh, music theory class. Kids loved him, called him J.S. Beach for J.S. Bach. But uh, he uh, started to teach us how to take dictation. What that is, is he would play a Bach chorale, which is very different from an adagio, but he would play a Bach chorale and we were supposed to sit there at our desks and write down the music for it. And uh, he, for several weeks there, he was kind of showing people in the class how to do this and how you, 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 you first, you get, the, you get the number in Roman numerals of the chord and you get the bass line and then and the second time through, you try to get the melody line and he would play it three or four times. And uh, then you try to get some of the inner voices that go in to make up the chord. And he was teaching us, man, I was just lost. I couldn't do this. He'd start out and he'd tell everybody what uh, key the thing was in. And he'd tell them probably the note, the first bass note of the, of the, of the, of the, of the chorale. And then uh, you were on your own. And I, man, I couldn't get three or four notes. And I was just, and, uh, and uh, it, just, it just wasn't working. I didn't know how to read music anywhere. Playing these guys, these pianists and these violinists, you know, they're eating it up and they're not having trouble. And they're kind of uh, trying to encourage me a little bit, but I, it ain't working out for me. And finally, we come to the end of the first quarter. And uh, when grades came out, I went rushing to my room and opened, uh, opened up my grades and looked at it. Dr. Beach, for the class, had given me an F. <laughs> and so... <laughs> I went and talked to him about it, and he says, well, you're trying. So uh, I signed up, registered for the next quarter, got into uh, 
got into theory for the next quarter, same thing. He's playing the piano, playing all these beautiful, beautiful songs. And I'm loving it. I'm feeling, you know, I'm feeling that God speaks, speaking to me through these, these songs. And after about two or three weeks, Dr. Beach made an announcement in class. He said, I am going to, I'm going to start doing a tutor session one night a week. For anybody who wants help with dictation or with anything else, come at seven o'clock on such and such a night. I think maybe it was Wednesday night when the class wasn't meeting and, and we'll just have a help session. We'll work on stuff a little bit more slowly and stuff like that. So fine. Next Wednesday night, I was there sitting there ready for the help session and I was the only one there. But he started taking me through dictation and trying to help me and trying to show me slowly, slowly, painfully. I was trying so hard and I didn't get it. I get so discouraged and everything else. Uh, but he helped me and he worked very, very slowly. And a couple weeks went by and I realized I was the only person coming to this help session. And then the light finally dawned on me. You know what? He's doing this for me. He was doing that help session strictly for me and giving up an hour of an evening a week away from his kids and family and everything else. Just, he was sacrificing for me. And man, I, was, I got in there and I tried so hard. And as time was going by, second quarter, I was beginning to sort of halfway get it. And when he gave a, a quiz, dictation huh I could get maybe half half of the song and half of it written down correctly and when grades came out at the end of second quarter you know what he had given me a C <laughs> I'd passed second quarter theory I was proud as I could get went on third quarter spring quarter right in there. Same thing going on in that class. He would play almost the whole period. Uh, just play and talk. He could just play these, uh, these songs, these beautiful, beautiful piano. I don't know what they were, concertos, adagios, whatever they were. And, and just talk to the class and stop the song in the middle, ask people about what on earth Bach was doing here. Sometimes he would play just simple chorales and ask the kids, you know, what, what's going on? These inner voices, why is he using this inversion? Why is he doing this? Why is he doing that? And, you know, I was kind of halfway learning and picking up and uh, 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 doing okay. At the end of third quarter, when I opened my grades, Dr. Beach had given me a C plus. And I'm telling you, that C plus third quarter in theory is to this day one of the proudest achievements of my life because man, did I work, man, did I get discouraged, man, did I keep on going because of the love of the music that I was being exposed to. You know, I would like to express my appreciation to Dr. Beach. He gave me a wonderful, wonderful gift. He taught me to love the music of Bach and of Handel and of an early, early composer named Palestrina who was doing music maybe a hundred years before Bach and uh, opened a whole new world and a new love for me and I appreciate it. I'd just like to talk to you guys who are graduating. Keep on. Throw yourself in to learning. And oftentimes you'll be faced with a world of learning that is so foreign to you, so hard. No! Go after it with everything, with everything you have. It is one of the grandest adventures of life to learn something that's hard. Some of the best things in life are the hardest things to learn. And these things are a gift. A gift from your parents, 
They sacrifice to help you learn. A gift from your teachers. A gift from this church. Because folks know that as you learn, you are walking hand in hand with God. As you are learning math, you are seeing the beauty that God has created in math. Same thing with biology. Same thing with language. God has made all of these things that you are learning. And as you dig deeper and try harder, you will find yourself drawn closer to Him. So let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Father, thank you for these kids that we have that are graduating. Please bless them. Thank you for the opportunities that we have and the gift of learning. And I pray that all of us can learn, struggle, strive, adventure, and learn for a lifetime. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.